Okay, so you know that this sermon is about uh, finances and cultivating contentment. But before we start talking about money, let's just talk about this time that we've been living in and the idea of cultivating contentment. One of the gifts of this time, of this time of COVID, and there have been gifts. One of the gifts has been this time to reflect. And normally people run from silence. People run from the question, how is it with my soul? But we've had time to ask ourselves these questions. And some have taken advantage of it. And, and, and because death has been looming, it makes you ask those, the, the, when you ponder mortality, it makes you ask big and existential questions. And that's why we're seeing a lot of people making changes in their lives. Uh, some are dramatic career changes. Uh, I'm going to make less money, but I'm going to have more time outside or more time with my family, or I'm going to embrace my art, or I'm going to start that business that I've always wanted to start, or I'm going to go live off the grid somewhere. Some people have gotten out of unhealthy relationships. You know, our time is limited here on earth. That has always been true. How are we going to use that precious time? And this is ripe fertile time for, for the church to ask itself, how do we use our precious time? How do we be in ministry to the longing that we are hearing within ourselves and within the culture? How can we make a difference in the life, in the lives of others here and now, rather than running back to, to same old, same old, to be asking the questions, to be listening and I think, you know, it's listening to ourselves, listening to one another, listening to the culture. How can we make Jesus Christ known in thought, word, and deed in Montclair, New Jersey? How are we speaking to the longing of God's people? Because uh, the world is suffering. What does Jesus have to say to that? How can Jesus bring healing? How can we be agents of that healing? How can we speak to the longing? And not with trite, pithy sayings like, oh, I'll I'll, I'll pray for you. And prayer is good. But how can we be? Uh, how is the Spirit calling us to be in ministry in this time and in this place? People will not run back to churches that are tone deaf to their longing. How can we help people cultivate contentment in their lives? And I'm the Spirit is planting that seed in our hearts this morning to ponder how can we be cultivating contentment, helping people to cultivate contentment in their lives. Last year, I planted uh, daffodils and hawera, which are tiny little daffodils that grow in bunches, and snowdrops, big and small. Um, and they gave me such joy. It's the first time I've ever done that. So it, it gave me such joy when they popped out of the ground through the snow. <laughs> you plant a bulb in the ground for it to go dormant until the earth said, hey, it's ready for you to shine and give such joy to all who see it, right? There's so much in, in transition here. At, at Grace Presbyterian Church is out, out of the world. Everything that's going on out there affects how we do in here. And, it, you know, and you're grieving, right? And there's you know, no way over it, no way under it, no way around it. You've got to go through it, right? But God is in the midst of this. It might be a dormant time to ponder and question, but let the Spirit work within us because after fall comes winter, and after winter comes spring, and what can emerge? I'm inviting you to, to make the mental shift that I recently made from, oh, Lord, how much, you know, how, you know, like how much longer, to, oh, my gosh, there's incredible opportunity here for us to reconsider, for us to reconnect, for us to ask the questions, how can we be vital 
in the lives of people, of your people who so desperately need to know that you are and that you are with. That reframing makes all the difference. New ministry, new relationships to be formed. And I'll say this, the spirit doesn't give a wit whether we make our budget if we are not helping people transform their lives. The stewardship people just went, (laughs) but it's true. The world is lonely. That was true before COVID. The world is angry. People do not know how to stay in relationship, disagree with one another and stay in relationship. It's ugly. How do we plant seeds of peace in, in here, in our hearts? So that, they, so that they can blossom in our relationships, in our homes, and then in our streets, and then our communities. How do we help people know that deep center and peace? So people of God, we make choices every day about how we're gonna use our time. Uh, and let me back up. Because I realized I jumped something and I really like what I wrote. Uh, how do we plant seeds of peace that start in here that blossom in our hearts and our homes and our streets and our community? Because that's why we exist. Cultivating peace, hope, joy, and love through faith in Jesus Christ. Let me say it again. Cultivating, cultivating, planting seeds, planting bulbs, planting Peace, hope, joy, and love that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. So we make choices every day about how we're going to use our time, our precious time, our energy, and our finances. So let's talk about that for a moment. And I don't know why I was inspired to do this, but we're going to do that. As Dr. Seuss, as my muse, I wrote this little poem. You can be lonely on a boat. You can be lonely drinking a root beer float. You can be sad in a fancy car. You can be sad as a Hollywood star. You can feel empty surrounded by people. You can feel empty underneath a tall steeple. You can have everything, all the world's stuff, and still sit and wonder whether you are enough. But faith in God offers a different way of being. You look at the world differently. It's a different way of seeing. The pursuit of lots of stuff can land you in a ditch, but counting your blessings one by one can make all of us feel rich. Yay. One of the characteristics, yeah, I have to be creative, otherwise my spirit shrivels. So anyway, so one of the characteristics of joy-filled people is that they make a head, I mean, you know, and this is one of those studies show, they really studies show that one of the habits of joy filled people is they make it a habit, a deliberate habit to count their blessings, to be grateful. And it's not just that some people are naturally grateful, they make a habit. They create something, whether it's first thing in the morning or, or at, before they go to bed at night to count their blessings, or they have a journal, or they write it on their calendar, or they write it on little pieces of paper, things that they want to thank, thank God for and put it in a jar, and then at the end of the year, pour it all out and read them all, right? They make a habit of counting their blessings, uh, cultivating contentment. We all know that we can focus on what's not good enough. Uh, what we're missing, what we're lacking, what he's not doing, hmm. what, how she fails you. Or we can focus on the good stuff. I actually just read somebody on, on Facebook, somebody I do not know very well, but it was a birthday of her spouse. And she started with, he drives me crazy. And does this whole list, including he snores. But then it went on to, but... And then just listed and, and, and he gives me the freedom and I wouldn't be able to do what I do without him. And it was this beautiful, you know, yeah, there is this stuff, but there's also all this wonderful too. Uh, we can always find, you know, um, the line I always say is I can always complain about something, but right. Sometimes, and, you know, on the other side of, of looking at, the, at 
at the negative or our focusing on discontent. Sometimes God uses our discontent to make change. And, and it's appropriate to, to feel discontent at the way things are. Again, the world is angry. The world is lonely. The world is. And that can be a call to get up. You know, Robin, leave your garden, put your, put your collar on and go and show up at the rally, show up at the protest, call your representatives, do what you need to do to make the world a more just place. So there is a place for discontentment. It's not all rosy yet. Sometimes that's a spirit prodding us. Hey, get up, do something. So there's that. But there are two tents that you can choose to live in. The contentment tent or the tent of discontent. <laughs> Say that 10 times fast. <laughs> the contentment tent or the tent of discontent. What kind of tent do you want to live in? I'm repeating some stuff from previous sermons. America, the United States, has affluenza which is the belief that we need more and more stuff to be happy. And also we are afflicted by credititis, which is, you know, no impulse control. We want it all and we want it now. Cue the queen song. Yeah. Right. So two weeks ago, we talked about the fact that how we use our finances is a spiritual decision. How we use our money reflects our faith and our values. Um, and we can use our money in ways that give us joy. So here are some uh, spiritual questions or goals that you might ask yourself. Uh, to live more simply makes it possible so that you can be more generous and that generosity gives you joy, right? To ask yourself the question, do I really need this? Uh, why do I want it? And, and this one that I, I find increasingly that I'm asking myself with, with, and with the environment, is this just going to end up in a landfill? And it, we're, we're just talking about, is it built to last? Um, or is this momentary satisfaction? We're being asked to live thoughtfully, not mindlessly, but thoughtfully. Um, and to consider living below your means so that you can be more generous. It, it, rule of thumb, I, you know, I've heard it said over the years that people you know, live up to their means, but you can choose differently. There was a book years ago that was called The Millionaire Next Door. And that was the, the folks that were, you were surprised um, had a lot of money because they chose to live simply. Um, I, that was written decades ago. So I wonder what that number would be now. Uh, but that's a choice that we can all make. Um, and, and here's an interesting one. Do you have to spend money to have fun? So these, again, are all seeds that are um, casting out uh, for you to have a conversation, for the spirit to have a conversation with you. Whether, you know, are there some big changes that you need to make to allow you to, sim to, to simplify downsizing, you know, selling that car so that you can buy another car and pay for it in full, uh, next the club membership that you never use. That's, this is a conversation for you to have with God. The best stewardship sermon I ever heard wasn't a sermon, it wasn't given by a pastor, it was given by a lay person and it lasted all of one minute. He stood up with a poster and he said, you all know what tithing is, right? It's giving to me. And he had $50,000 written on the poster. You just, you know, take off the last zero and he ripped the poster and he goes, and this is what you're supposed to go. You're supposed to give. And then he goes, this has never worked for me. And then, he, you know, dramatically tore the whole thing up. And he goes, he, and he said, this is give until, give until you have a sense of joy. And I was like, Wow. Give to you know, and and the other piece of that is uh, what we get to give to. Give to things that give you joy. Uh, are you living in such a way that can support mission and ministry so that you can so that you can feel awesome? And I'm not just talking about giving to the to the local church. It can be other charitable organizations. I give to Doctors Without Borders. I I am so thrilled that I get to be part of that ministry. I have not one fiber of my being that is called to be a nurse. <laughs> not one. You know, we all have those things like, oh, God bless you. I can never do that. Some people feel that way about my job. I, when I see nurses, you know, um, blood, no, thank you. 
God bless you, you know, right? But I get to be part of they, those doctors and those nurses show up in war-torn places where nobody wants to be to bring healing. And I get to be part of that, right? So that's that, you know, what gives you joy? Give to those things. Uh, what makes God proud makes us proud of ourselves, right? So next week in worship, we're going to celebrate our ministry, the ministry of Grace Presbyterian Church. And and I hope that supporting the ministry of this church gives you joy. Um, and if, and again, that, that seed planting, if you can imagine ways that God is calling the church to be in ministry in this time moving forward, be thinking and praying about that. Um, and, and just also so that you know that if God is whispering in your ear, God usually wants you to be part of it. Uh, but that, which will be something that you'll be proud of yourself for being part of it. And it's all good. Right, but to be, what is the spirit percolating? Um, how can we be in ministry with a community that brings life and light? And next week we're going to celebrate the ways that we are in ministry with the community that bring life and light. So I look forward to celebrating with you next week. Uh, but in the meantime, I encourage you to pray about what you're giving to Grace might be next year. And by the way. Uh, well, I, I won't say that because I'm not sure yet. All right. Um, it's not my decision to make. It should be one way in conversation, but we'll see. Um, I encourage you to pray about it, uh, about what your God is calling for you for next year to make your giving to be. And whatever, whatever you decide, I pray that your decision gives you joy. In Jesus' name. Amen.